Can I get a water, somebody? Is that fresh? Oh, sweet. I don't usually drink water until I preach. Sort of like what Pastor Terry mentioned. He says the only dry part of him is his mouth. And I have experienced that many times. This is my first time using this pulpit. It's nice. It's really nice. I don't know if I'll be able to stay up here. I'll try my best to stay up here because typically, uh, see, I'm already doing it. Typically when I speak, <laughs> I like to get, you know, out with everybody. But, um, but yeah, but there's been, um, there's been a flow to the, the last couple of messages that have come from here, starting with Justin. Justin really set a tone with the messages that have been coming out. And, um, and he preached about old and new weapons, but, but a lot of his message hit on David and, and the call of God through David. You know, he was anointed king and his job was to be king. And, uh, and I've, I've, really, I've really picked up on that, that message because then Pastor Terry went into preaching about the call to victory, right? And he started preaching about that call and he used, he used Saul of Tarsus, Tarsus. And I'm going to read his same foundational scripture for my message. And my message is entitled, The Call to Faith. And, uh, and that just came because I read Hebrews 11 uh, over and over and over again because I, I started seeing new things in there and it, it was really starting to pop in my life. And, uh, and I... I, you know, I was listening to Pastor Terry, and he was talking about, you know, the, the, blood, of the, the blood of the martyr is the seed of the church, you know, and, and, and as he's saying these things, and when Justin's up there preaching, and he starts talking about how Goliath, you know, how David went and grabbed Goliath's sword, and, and you know, and God just started reminding him of the call, he was called to be king. You know, that's really what it feels like oftentimes when I come and I stand before people and I preach. I feel called to do this. This feels like my life. This feels like what I've been destined to do. And I feel that call. And, and, um, and I can tell you really and honestly that when God really started burdening my heart and speaking to my heart, it's really exactly like what Jeremiah said. When he said, listen, you know what? I'm not going to preach in your name anymore, God. But I can't. Because it's a fire in my bones. And I've, tr- I've done that. I've tried that with God. I told you guys about that in Kansas City. I tried that. I said, listen, I'm done with this. I can't do this anymore. But it's something that grips you so deep, and it really is. It's inside of your heart that what happens is, and I've tried this. I've tried running. But what happens is when that call burns so deep within you, you end up falling to your knees and crying out, Jesus, my God and my Savior. And nothing, and it always brings you back to this point because it's something that burns so deep inside of you. And so I really caught the flow of these messages, and I really want to keep it going because that's what's really inside of me is the call. And especially for guys, uh, you know, for girls, it, it, might, you might, it might grab you too, but for a guy, the adventure, right? The call, the, you know, the, against all odds. And all that's, you know, when you hear Justin preach, wasn't that, wasn't that what it was all like? It's against all odds. And when Pastor Terry came up and started talking about John Lake, and he said, you know, we're going back in there. We got no money, even if you got to bury us, you know. And, and, and so that's, that's something that grips a man's heart. And I don't know how much it is for ladies, but uh, for boys, it's very much that way. You know, we get this sense of adventure in this. And that's why I love the, the Christian life so much, because it is a life, if you do it right, it's a life all or nothing. It's a life that is set apart and holy for God. And there's no plan B and there's no backup plan. And that is something that is... It's, it's a thrill, it, 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 you know, you know it's, it's, it captivates your heart when you understand and start grasping what God has really called us to do and really called us to be. It's, it, it, it's something that you can't run away from. It's amazing. And so I called this message a call to faith, keeping much in step with, with what Pastor Terry had spoken about. And I just want to read his scripture um, in Acts chapter 9. Um... What is it, verse 6? Verse 5? Go to, go to verse 6. Verse 6 is the one that says, Now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So that's that call. That right there, that puts something inside of, of Saul that, that he, he couldn't from that day run away from. Go and do, go and be told what you must do. And so that is birthed deep inside of him. And so that, that same call, I feel that call, and I know a few men... Um, who have a similar call, especially, especially like I mentioned last night at corporate prayer, especially pastors. For, for a pastor to hear that call and to take it up, I, you know, I talked to Pastor Wes last night, and I just honored him and said, listen, you took up the call. You heard it, and you took it up. And that is very honoring to God, and, and, and that blesses me so much because I see this, this thing that rises inside of us just to do what God wants us to do, and it blesses me so much, and so I won't say any more on that. But um, I have to say... Sort of two things with this message. Uh, it might sound disjointed, but it really all flows together. Um, I hope I can make it flow together. If not, you're just going to have to build the bridge yourself and, you know, make it, make it work for yourselves. 
But, uh, you know, this all started a couple weeks before Justin preached, actually. Um, Pastor Terry had finished a sermon, and he had the worship team line up, and he decided to pray for us. And, uh, and so that was good. He prayed for me, and I went down, and I just started to hear the voice of God speaking to me about some questions I had due to the kingdom of God. I had some questions about the kingdom, because, you know, I had preached on the kingdom before. I had spoken about it, but there was still, there was one verse that sort of nagged me a bit, and that's in Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. It says, this is, you know, this is, anyways, once having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful, careful observation, nor will people say here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. And this verse was playing over and over and over in my head because when that last time when I preached about the kingdom of God, and it was, it's true, but I I'd, I'd sort of was in this mindset that you could almost liken the kingdom of God to like a physical town like that has city limits. Where, you know, where you can almost say like, well, the kingdom of God is in this building. You know, if we go to church tonight, we're going to step into the kingdom of God. Much like, you know, that corner, that corner, that corner, that corner. If you step out of there, you're out of the kingdom. And that sort of was my perception. But this verse was sort of nagging me a bit. The kingdom of God is within you. And I got thinking and thinking, and God was just ministering to me on the floor, and he began to speak to me some truths. And you know what song he used? And it's perfect. This is why I said it's perfect tonight. He used the song, Be Lifted High. And I just want to grab that song. Let me, let me just read it. Oh, there it is. Okay. It goes like this. Be lifted high, be lifted high. For your glory, be lifted high. And then there's the second chorus that says, Be lifted high, be lifted high. Higher and higher, Lord. And he started, this, this song just kept playing over and over and over again in my head, and it kept saying, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. Be high and lifted up. Be high and lifted up. And suddenly, God started downloading to me some things about the kingdom. He said, why are you singing this song? I said, well, God, we want to lift you up. And he says, well, haven't I already been given the name above every other names? How can I be lifted high? How can I be any higher than I am right now? And I started pondering. I don't, I was starting to think, I don't, I really, you know what, God, I don't know. I, how can you be high and lifted up? How can you get any more lifted up than you are right now? And he began to speak and he said, listen, I already have the position higher than any other name. But what about my position in your heart? Is my position in your heart the highest position that can be attained and he says, and he started just, actually I started almost feeling the heart of the man who wrote this. When he's saying, listen God, be lifted high, be lifted high, higher. He's saying, God, you know what in my life? Be lifted high. I want you to rule over my life, Lord Jesus. Be the king of my life, Lord Jesus. Rule over and reign over every situation of my life. There's these things I have, you know what? I elevate you higher and higher, Lord. Higher and higher for your glory. Be lifted high. And he started really downloading this to me. And then I, then I got thinking, I get it. This is why Jesus, Jesus made that statement said, the kingdom of God is within you. And I started understanding even more statements about things like, uh, you know, when it says you can advance the kingdom of God and forceful men are taking hold of it. I started realizing that there's some things and there's some, there's some things that we can do practically in our lives. And just, it was just all on the floor. You know, you get those moments sometimes with God that are sort of practical. And, uh, and this was one of those practical things. He just started teaching me higher and higher. Give me a greater role in your life. And so one of, the, one of the easier ways to understand the kingdom of God is, is to say wherever the rule of God is, there the kingdom of God is. Wherever his reign is, that's where his kingdom is. If you see the reign of God or the rule of God somewhere, his kingdom, his kingdom is there. And, and Jesus said, well, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, no, the kingdom of God has come to you. What he's saying is, listen, this man was set free. The kingdom of God is, is, is here. The reign of God has just taken place right here. This is his realm now. This is his authority. And so this was really cool as I'm starting to think of this because as, uh, you know, I'm, as, as I'm thinking, God, be lifted high in my life. Be lifted high, higher and higher and higher. Oh, God, can't you be lifted higher in my life? Take authority over every single area of my life. And I started seeing neat things about the kingdom of God. And actually, just life in general. I saw the two kingdoms that are at war in this world. There's the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, or the kingdom of heaven. And I saw how somebody who lives in the kingdom of darkness, whose master is, is, is you know, Satan, I watch how their lives, and this is just the truth in the earth, their lives will reflect or manifest that the life of that kingdom or the, you know, the, the, the way you live in that kingdom. So 
you know, as an example, somebody who's living in the world and who's under the leadership of the kingdom of darkness will manifest things like addiction. That comes with the kingdom of darkness. Or it will come, you know, by the way of um, lust or cheating or lying or stealing. These are things that manifest out of your life. But somebody who has the kingdom of God in their lives and has advanced it, their lives produce different things, don't they? Their lives will produce things like joy, peace, patience, and I preached about that one time. And I thought this was neat because we can look at our lives and we can try and say, you know, we look at the Bible and we say, well, how come we're just not like these people? You know, they lay hands on the sick, but the sick got healed there, and we lay hands on the sick, and nobody gets healed. Well, maybe the problem, maybe the problem that lies in where our, what, what the rulership is over our lives. If our lives are producing the things of this world, maybe the world is ruling our lives. Because if the King, is, if the king Jesus is ruling our lives, we will produce the things of his kingdom. Is this true? Okay, how about Acts 3? I don't know if I put this on here. Acts 3, 1 to 10, you guys know the story. Peter and John, they're going to the temple, right? They're headed to the temple. The guy stops him and says, can I get some money? And he says, no, 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 silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to you. Do you see what just happened there? What their life produces was given out. What I have, what is in me, the rulership of God is in me. It's, I've elevated him to the highest position, and now what I have I give to you. And one of the one of the questions that um, sometimes I struggle with, and I sort of got the answer for this all kind of on the floor, um, was some of the arguments you can make and some of the things you can say is, well, how come it works so well for them? You know, why, why so well for them? How come when they got saved, immediately, bang, they went to work? Like they're healing the sick right away. You read it, you read it in the Bible. Right as soon as, it, as soon as they come into the knowledge of Christ, all of a sudden they're starting to do the things of the kingdom. And I got thinking, like, why is this? And, and, and very simply... And don't get mad, I'll explain this answer. Very simply, the reason why this happened, why it was so effective for them, and why it is not for us today. Don't get mad, because I'm going to explain this. Because I could just, I could already see it, I can already feel it in the air, don't get mad. It's because they were Jewish. And so some of you, you just, you're, just don't fly off on me. They were Jewish. These men were Jewish men. And I spoke this once on Wednesday. And uh, you've got to, we've got to go back and, and think and understand Something about the Jewish life at this time. Something about what it meant to be a Jewish man. You see, a Jewish man and Jewish men and, and the Jewish people at that time, they were looking forward to a promise, weren't they, a Messiah? They were looking ahead for a promise. They said, there is one coming. You know, you know, what, you know what I bet happened? And I can guarantee this happened. A Jewish man would sit his boy down in, from a young age, and he'd start him young, and he'd start, you know, as he's growing up, and he'd tell him all the time, listen, son. The Bible says, or whatever the, the Torah, or, you know, the Word of God says this. There is coming one who's going to restore all things on the earth. He is going to vindicate our people. He is going to rule in righteousness. He will reign in justice. There is one coming son who's going to make all things right. And he would drill this into his kid over and over and over. And the boy grew up believing that there is one coming. And the dad would say, you know what? When this time comes, we've got to give our whole lives over to this king. He's going to reign on David's throne. And when he does, we've, we're, we're going we're gonna to let our lives be consumed by this, by this one. Everything he says, we're going to do. We're, gonna, we're not going to hold nothing back from him because he's the one we've been waiting for. God promised us the Messiah. He promised us this guy. And so over and over, it's just drilled, drilled into their heads. And so they've been waiting and waiting, and, and centuries are going by, aren't they? And centuries are going by, but... The fathers are till, still telling the sons. In fact, um, I, I heard this, but Pastor Bobby, you could probably clarify this. Is it true before the Bible was written, like on parchment, it was word of mouth passed down generation to generation? So we know this is true. We know this is true that, that uh, they, they would say over and over and over again, they say, listen, they said it was through David's line. So we, son, we know that he's going to be of the seed and the root of Jesse. We know through David's line, and he's going to rule on David's throne. He's going to rule in justice. And of, the, and of the increase of his kingdom, it will know no end. And this is drilled into them. And so we get a little more understanding then. Uh, come Palm Sunday. When Jesus, is this when Jesus is coming into Jerusalem? And they're laying down the palm trees. They're saying, Hosanna! Hosanna! The one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he, you know? And, and I got reading this and got understanding this. Because they're hailing him in as king. 
They think that he's going to come and conquer the Romans and vindicate the people and everything that he said or they thought that he was supposed to do. So they're laying down, they're saying, you are our king, you are our king. And, and this is great, you know, this is, this is something cool. They're, can you imagine the excitement in these kids? Or, you know, grown-ups probably now, but even in the kids. He's here! We've been waiting for so long, we've been believing for so long, our king has finally come. And I thought to myself, and as I read that, I asked, if they believed he was a king, and this, this man, Jesus, was supposed to conquer the Romans, where was his army? Because as we know, a king doesn't fight, a king leads. The army does the fighting. And so I thought this was interesting because, you know, these people are saying, Hosanna, here comes the king, here comes the king. But none of them are stopping and saying, well, here's, here's the king, but where's the army that's supposed to destroy these Romans? You know why they didn't think that way? I'll tell you what they thought. When they were saying Hosanna and laying down those palm leaves, you know what they were thinking? Hail our king, we will fight for you. We will work for you. We will give up our lives for you. And see, the difference between the first century Jew and the 21st century Christian is that they got saved to lay down their lives for Jesus. We got saved, so he lays down his life for us. Do you see the difference? There's a big difference. They got saved and went to work. We got saved so Jesus could work for us. And it's backwards. It's switched. And so you understand now why in the book of Acts, somebody says, our Messiah is here. He's come. They say, okay, my life is focused. It is pointed towards Jesus. Everything about me has got to take up what he said to do. And no question, what happened? Jesus was lifted high in their life. Jesus was high and lifted up. His rule and his reign was final in their lives. And you saw it, didn't they? They went to, they went to their deaths for Jesus. They literally went to their deaths. And I could feel it in the air in here when Pastor Terry said that, that the blood of the martyr is the seed of the church. I could feel the popping in the minds in here going, that's too radical. That's too extreme. Yeah, it is for our culture, but that's not the Bible. Jesus is a king that demands our respect. And he does. He demands it. He's not a wimpy king. He's not a sissy. He really does rule. He's everything that the Bible declared him to be. He does have the name higher than any other name. Isn't it true that at his name, demons got to bow and flee? Isn't it true that at his name, sick are healed and the dead are raised? Isn't that the truth? He is not a wimpy king. He's not a sissy king. So I don't know where we got it in our heads that we thought that salvation was something where we gain so much. I don't even know what you call it. It's like we go on vacation. Where did that come in? These guys, they said, of course, once Jesus didn't turn out to be the Messiah, they thought they turned tail and fled. Just like if you read Josephus, there was many people that rose up and said they were going to be Messiah. But all of them were ready to lay down their lives for, for the one they believed to be him. But nevertheless, you know, where did we get it off thinking that, oh, here's, our, here's the Messiah. You die for us. You work for us. You bless us. You do everything for us. And we'll give you an hour on Sunday. And I hope... I hope, God, that, you know, my, everything goes well. I want my kids to be safe. I want, you know, I want my church to go well. I want my finances to be just so-so. I'd really like to have a nice house. You know, we go off on all these crazy tangents that you can't find in, these, in the lives of these people. So we don't have an excuse when we say, how come it was so easy for them? We can't say that because we're not them. We're called to be like them. We're called to be the people that have Jesus so high and lifted up in our lives, that has such authority in our lives that he literally, no matter what he says goes, everything, we're not afraid of one thing that he asks. That's what he's called us to be. My throat's dry. I think this is interesting because Pastor Terry's been preaching messages, and well, since this happened, he preached a lot of what I'm saying he's already said. And some of you are going like, wow, that's awesome, but he's already said it. <laughs> and, you know, like he's already said these words. But this is what burns in my heart. This is the call in my life is to cause people to, to, to let Jesus be lifted high in their lives. This is, if you listen to me preach constantly, 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 that's what I'm challenging God's people to do. To lay down and to become, well, John the Baptist said it this way. He says, I've got to decrease and he must increase. We've just got to become less and less in our own eyes. Our opinion of ourselves has got to decrease and we've got to make him more valuable to us. And so um, I think it was interesting because this is, you know, not to, you know, say that you guys are all bad. We're, this, is, this is, we're starting to work in our lives. We're starting to see some results. In fact, I'll prove it to you. We have an internet thing now, a uh, prayer request, and people are, you know, typing in for prayer requesting from strange countries. We got Sweden. Do you know all of them? There's like Sweden. There's uh, the Philippines. There's Great Britain. There's a couple of other ones that were just weird. You know, never even... Third, heard of these. What's that? Yeah, there's Croatia. 
And didn't Jesus say, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself? He was talking about, of course, the cross, but that is the same spiritual principle that works when you lift him high in your life and you begin, see what happens is we lift him high and he becomes everything and our lives start to ooze Jesus. It oozes it. You can't get away from it. Peter and John, what I have, it oozes. It comes out of me. What I have, it comes out now. And you know what? That attracts people. People who are desperate in need. He is, he is a God of hope and healing and restoration. This is, that's the truth. That is the truth. You can read it in the Bible for yourself. That is the absolute truth. And people who want hope are going to run after, the one, uh, after those who got hope. And if you're oozing hope, they're coming to you. If you've got restoration in your life, they're coming to you. And you shouldn't be surprised. And I bet you, you know what? You wouldn't be surprised. You know, I was talking to Robbie about the people in Bethel that are like laying hands on sick people like in the mall or whatever, and they're getting healed. And again, it's the same scenario because people say, well, why not me? They say, well, they're just like me. No, they're not just like you. They're not. Their lives are nothing the same as the lives that we pretend to live. It's amazing. I'm telling you. People that really get onto this, and Uncle Daryl, I've heard your stories. Believe me. I know the life, when you started talking about people getting sick and sick that were getting healed, he kept sharing this thing that stuck with me forever. The Lord would speak to him on the ride home and say, listen, are you coming? Are you coming? Yeah, God, I'm coming to meet with you. Are you coming? Are you coming? That's not the normal Christianity of today, but that's right. That's the way this is meant to be. When Jesus is the highest form, he's the greatest opinion you have. It, it, your answer is Jesus for every problem. He is, he's fixed. It's a fixed thing. Okay, what do my notes say? <laughs> okay. Faith. Let's talk about faith now because these two actually work together. Let's talk about faith. Let's go to Hebrews 11. If you're taking notes, there's going to be a few points in here. Uh, I'm not usually a point preacher, but it, they just... This really, this preaches itself because I'll read this and you guys will probably already get the revelation before I have to say anything. So really, I, you know, I don't know how long I've been preaching, but I, it doesn't look like I have that much further to go necessarily, but who knows what happens because, because really this, you'll get it, it'll, it'll just bang as soon as, I, as soon as I speak the words out loud, you, you'll catch it. Okay, Hebrews 11. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Okay, that's... That's uh, um, the writer of Hebrews here. This whole chapter in chapter 11 is, he's, what he's trying to do is convey, um, like he's, he's really trying to give us a, a perspective on what faith is, what the substance of faith is, what faith is all about. And this isn't the whole answer what faith is. This is his opening statement. If you read all of chapter 11, he goes in to say, okay, it's like this, and it's like this, and you know what? It's even like this, and it's like this. So what he's trying to do is give us the substance of what faith is and try to, try to get us to wrap our minds around the whole thing. And so he goes in, and if we keep reading, um, uh, this is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offering. By faith, he still speaks even though he is dead. Isn't that interesting? By faith, he speaks even though he is still dead. So he's trying to give us the nature of faith. What is faith like? Well, faith, faith has the ability to live on past our lives. Faith has the ability to live outside of timelines, okay? This is the first thing we want to understand is that faith is not bound to time. And we can know that very well because Jesus died 2,000 years ago, but we still have faith that he died, didn't we? We, we have faith on an event 2,000 years ago. Faith is not bound by time. And so, so you know, so, so he's, he's laying this out here and he's trying to give us what this is all about. And uh, was it Abel? Yeah, Abel's faith is still speaking even though he is dead. And this isn't just true for Abel. I mean, we can name men of God all throughout history books. And, we can, and we're drawing stuff off of their faith, their experiences in God. And isn't it awesome because you get you go going back and you get reading about other men who were called too. And you hear their lives and you see the way they ran the race and you're like, yes, look at that man. Look at what he did. You see how, he, see how his head was chopped off like that? That's amazing. You know, and, that's just, and you're like, wow, his faith is speaking to me. You know, and your faith just gets lit because someone else decided that they were going to give Jesus the highest place in their life. And so we keep going here. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life. Isn't that interesting? You need faith to get raptured. You need faith to be taken from this life. I thought that was really neat. If you read about Enoch, it says he walked with God and he wasn't. 
Isn't that what we would call the typical rapture? You ain't going anywhere without faith. And I like faith because this is the same faith that heals the sick, raises the dead, casts out demons that you were saved with and that, you know, that Enoch was taken with. And so, you know, this doesn't apply to much of you, but for you on the internet, you know, the ones that say, well, God doesn't heal today, God doesn't set people free today, God doesn't deliver anybody from demons today, but you expect to go somewhere at the time of the rapture, you ain't going anywhere. Not without faith. Not without the same faith that raises the dead. Not without the same faith that saved you. You can't go anywhere. It was by faith that Enoch was taken. And it says, For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Faith pleases God. If we were to do another point, I'll just tell you, if, if, you're, if you're writing points, um, the first one was faith has no timeline. The second one is faith is what pleases God. And I don't usually do points, but that's, that's kind of neat if you want to write them down. Faith is what pleases God. God is not pleased by just our, our effort and our ability because that's not, because he made us. You know, he can do, he can already do what we can do, but it is faith that pleases him. Believe in God. You know, if, let's just, I just want to take this, let's just simplify, I don't like simplifying faith, but if I could just do it just to help us wrap our minds around this. You know, the Bible says uh, in Genesis, when it talks about Abraham, it says, now Abraham believed God. Now, it's interesting because how many people were on the earth and God noticed Abraham. He said, Abraham believed God. So if we take, and, and Abraham's commended for having great faith. So if we take faith, you know, without trying to lose so much of its, you know, luster and, and trying to lose so much of what it really is. Faith is really believing God. Believing that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. Those Jews waiting for the Messiah all those years, they, they're just waiting, believing that God is going to do. And they're still trying to do it today, aren't they? They're still believing that God is going to do what he said he was going to do. And so if we just look at it that way, it's, it, we simplify it, but try not to lose some of its, its power. Okay, now by faith, verse 7, Noah was warned about things not yet seen. In holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness that comes by faith. Now, I thought this was interesting. Noah's faith made a separation. It made a distinction between the people of God and the people of this world. The Bible puts it this way. He condemned the world. But isn't this what, isn't this, isn't this really, this, remember, this is the substance of what faith is. How do we know what faith is? Is it dividing the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of, this God, uh, of our God. Faith is a division line between the two. God's people believe him. God's people have faith in him. God's people trust him. And so I, you know, without, without just rambling too much, sometimes I think it's, it's so crazy, you know, when I listen and I hear conversations and people and they just say, well, I just, I just don't believe that. Or I just don't believe God can do this. Or I, you know what, I sort of believe you know, I just, I kind of believe, I, I believe I'm saved, but, you know, I'm just going to work out, I'm all right with all my sickness, and I'm all right with all this stuff, I'm, I'm just ready to, you know, just ready to, I'm okay with that, and to me, I just, I don't like that, because in the, in the Bible, it's very clear, faith makes a distinction, God's people believe him, and they believe him only, God's people have lifted him and elevated, see, this is what I'm trying to get across, God's people lift God to the highest position possible, and they don't make excuses when he's not, you know what they do? They fall on their knees and say, I repent. I want, you to be the, I want you to be the center of my life again. That's what God's people do. And so this is faith. We go past Noah to verse 8. It says, by faith Abraham, when, he, uh, when called to a place where he would later receive his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. My next point. Faith looks forward. Faith does. Faith looks forward. Abraham was commended for, for his great faith. Abraham, Abraham was a man, as we know, did not receive the promise in his lifetime. But he looked forward. I love that. I love that. I love that. Because, because it's just, it's something that we're going to need to draw on in the future. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to get around to this. It's something we're going to have to learn from Abraham. We're going to have to learn from these ancient people. We're going to have to learn from all the ones who went before us. Because they did something unique that we don't do anymore. I've heard bits and pieces of it out there, but 
wide and large, we've forgotten it or we, we haven't done it. Okay, if we keep going, let's just jump down to verse 13. All these people were still living by faith when they died. Oh. The writer of Hebrews doesn't put that in there to discourage us. He doesn't, he's, remember, he's trying to tell us the nature of faith. What is faith like? All these people were still living by faith when they died. Hallelujah! They were living by faith even once they died. They were right to the very end. These people were living by faith. And it goes on to say, they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Isn't that something? Isn't that crazy? And this is, this is something I want to talk about tonight is vision. These men and these patriarchs and all these ancients that went before them, they had a vision before their eyes. Abraham was told he was going to be the father of many nations. He was told, and the Bible says that he did not receive the promise in this life. He only saw it from a distance and welcomed it. You know what that tells me? That tells me he was so fixed on that vision. He was so focused on that vision, he was actually living in it. He was actually living there. Even though it didn't happen to him in this life, he was still there. He says, I'm welcome. That's, that's the promise. That's the future. I'm believing that that's it, and there I am. There I am, and if we keep reading, it'll, even, it'll confirm this, and it says this. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on the earth. This isn't my place. That's my place. People who say such things show that they're looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have opportunity to return. So do you see how this works? Abraham and these guys, they're looking ahead, and they're seeing such great vision. They're seeing such a great thing that God has promised that they're actually living there. And if they had not been living there, they would have a chance to look around and see, whoa, this isn't what God promised, and they'd have a chance to actually fall out of faith. But that's not, the way they, that's not the way they did this, and that's not what we're called to do. We're called to live such a way that literally our vision and the thing we're running after is so immersed around us that that's where we are. That's where we are. And if we had a chance to look around, why are, it, it, I mean, it, it, says, it, it shows us why there's so much backsliding. Because that's what we do. We look around, don't we? We're not there. And I love what Pastor Terry said. Let's be heavenly minded. So heavenly minded. Let's be heavenly minded. Because that, that stupid saying about, should I say that word? I don't know. It's too heavenly minded, no earthly good. The Bible says set your heart and mind on things above. Set your hearts on it. Be not swayed one way or the other. Don't be a wave tossed to and fro. If you're going to set your mind, then set your mind. That's where you're going. Don't look back and don't look side to side. And that's what these boys did. And so there's really something cool about this looking ahead. And let's just jump. I'm going to go to the next side of my page. But I don't know where you guys have to go to get to verse 25. 20, 24 or 25-ish. It's Moses. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as, this is verse 24, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, 25 now. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ. How does Moses regard disgrace for the sake of Christ? How many years before Jesus did he live? How does Moses regard disgrace for the sake of Christ? I'll tell you why. Because he had a vision in front of him, and he was living there. How was Abraham justified by faith? Because he saw the promise, one day, boy, one day all these things are going to be made right. One day there's going to be one who comes and who's going to set and restore all things. That's how Moses saw Jesus. That's how Moses looked ahead and saw the Messiah. That's how he did it. That's how he said, you know what? Pharaoh and all his pleasures and all this stuff, I, I can't even see it because there's something ahead of me. There's something ahead of me so valuable. It's so important and so precious. I'm actually going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to walk as if I'm there right now. I'm going to walk in that light over there. And it just happened that he turned out to be a slave with the rest of them in the natural. Well, let's just, I just keep reading here. Oh, because I always preach what it's going to say, and it, you'll, you'll read it. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his great reward. Okay, so Jesus and the Messiah, that was his great reward. Is great and surpassing reward. He was looking ahead. He had seen it and he was going after it. He was going after it. Sometimes when you don't use notes very often and you try to look at your notes, you're like, what sermon am I preaching here? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but anyways. Okay. So this is the nature of faith then. This is the nature of faith. And there's something to this looking forward. I, I'll share this just for a bit. There's something to this looking forward and using your faith and looking forward. And I've heard Pastor Steve say this, and it was, it was very interesting to me. 
Um, Abraham, Moses, David, right? All of these guys commended for their faith. And he goes on and says, should I talk about Samuel? How about should I talk about Rahab? How about should I talk about all these people, all their faith? You know, he goes on. All these people had the ability to take their faith and propel it into the future and look and have a vision and, and, and be living and be living according to God's promise, not according to their natural surroundings, okay? Now, how does this work then with the kingdom of God? How does this work in our everyday lives? How does this work then when somebody comes up and they have cancer? Question. When God is ruling and reigning and his kingdom and his authority is operating, is there cancer in that realm? No. But does this person have cancer here? Yes. So what do we need then? What's the issue? This is our surroundings. This is the country we come to. This is the country all around us. But the Bible says that these boys, they didn't live in the country they were, but they were looking ahead. It actually says, if I just go back and read it, it says, um, people who say such things show that they're looking for a country of their own. And it says, where is it? There's, oh yeah, instead they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. And so there's something about this, about the kingdom of God being our, it's our present, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's reality right now. We can have the kingdom of God right now, right? But the fullness of the kingdom of God is in our future. It hasn't yet come. Jesus hasn't yet established his throne on the earth. That hasn't yet happened. But it is our future. And we can take a little bit of that future and we can have it right now. But we can't have it now when we got our eyes on our circumstance and when we got our eyes in this country. If our eyes can still see our country, then we can return to it. But if our eyes are fixed and focused on the heavenly one, if our eyes are fixed and focused on the, on the realm and the, and the authority that Jesus is supposed to bring, well, then you just walk up to somebody and say, listen, this isn't supposed to be yours right now, but I'm going to give you your future just a little bit early. I'll prove it to you right now. Acts chapter 3. Third time I use this. Let's go to Acts chapter 3. One day, Peter and John were going to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple called, gate called Beautiful, where he was put, put every day to beg from those going to the temple, into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter, <laughs> Peter looked straight at him as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something. Peter said, silver and gold, have I none, right? I ain't looking one way or the other. Silver and gold, have I none. But what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk, and the man was healed. This is what happened. This man in the natural shouldn't have been healed, but something happened that these guys, remember, their lives are fixed in Christ, right? Jesus has the highest position in their lives. He does. They died for him. They, they were martyred for Jesus. And so what did they do? They walked up to this guy and said, this is the future, and I've got his name. I've got the name of my great king. This is his authority. This is his rule. And wherever the rule of God is, there the kingdom of God is. And they just took his hand and gave him his future a little bit early. They used their faith to look forward to what is not yet, but they pulled it into the now. They yanked on it and they said, this is going to happen right now because that's our promise. This is the promise of the future and we can have it right now. And this is something that Jesus established on the earth. He did it. He says, go now all of you and go cast out demons in my name. Go do it in my name. I am going to be the king of a kingdom and you are going to usher in my presence. You're going to usher in that, that, that rulership. An easier way to understand this, um, when Justin was preaching, remember we talked about David? He went into the cave. Uh, you know, he, he was on the run from Saul. He went into the cave. Remember, a whole bunch of people left Saul's kingdom and went and lived in the cave with David. Wouldn't you think that is a little strange? Why would you go there? Something tells me about these men. They had faith. You know why? They knew that David was supposed to be king. They knew it. So you know what they did? They pulled themselves out of the natural realm and aligned their lives with the kingdom that is coming. The kingdom that is on its way, they, they left the pleasures of Saul's kingdom. They left, they left united Israel and went and decided, you know what, things don't look good right now. But I, I know, I see the promises. I know what's in front of me. I can't even see my left and my right. I'm going to stand right there. I'm, gonna st- I'm, I'm living right there in the promise of God. And so they aligned themselves with David's rule before David ever took the throne. And it's what we're called to be as Christians. We're supposed to not look left or right. We're not supposed to see, see this country or that country. Because if you do, you've you got the opportunity to go back. 
That's, why, that's the danger of looking around. That's why we've got to have our minds set. That's why we've got to be fixed. That's why Jesus has got to be the Lord of our lives. That's why he's got to be high and lifted up. That's why he cannot compete in our lives for anything else. If Jesus is competing in our lives for something, if we're saying, well, I just don't know if I'm going to serve him or if I'm just going to live my own life. I tell you this, and I say this in humility, that probably, 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 I, okay, I'll put it this way. Jesus won't compete for you. He's not going to compete for you. This is where humanism has, has reeked into the church and told us that, oh, he's, you know, no, he's, a, he's not a sissy king. He's a king. You're on his side. You choose his side. You come to his side. You lay down the palm branch. Hosanna. I'm ready to lay down my life for you, king. He did not go to those people and say, would you please serve me? Would you please follow me? David never went to those men and say, um, you know what? I'm trying to start a kingdom. I would really like it if you, if you came and joined me. That's not the way this went down. To serve a king, you've got to go to the king. You've got to pledge your allegiance to the king and not look side to side or left and right. And with Jesus, we get a great promise, a promise of the future that we get to pull into the now. Aren't you glad? Because everyone, see, it's funny, we use our faith to push, you know, to, to grab our salvation 2,000 years from the past, right? We, we do that. We say Jesus was crucified 2,000 years ago. We're believing on that event. That's where our faith lies. But the problem is, is we keep, and it's not always bad because faith is not in timeline, right? Faith is not in the, so we always go back. We always say, well, you know, it was, and this is not bad. We always go by his stripes. We always go by this. But what about the, what about, look at, I wasn't going to go here, but what about, what about Revelation 19? What about this one? What if we put our faith on this one? Watch this. I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is what? Faithful and true. With justice he judges and makes war. That doesn't sound like a sissy to me. His eyes are a blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. Why don't we look forward to the one who's going to wage war on the kingdom of this world? We can look forward to that. And not only can we look forward, we can pull that, that into reality. And that can become our now. How is it that people in California can go and lay hands on people and they receive their healing? How is that possible? Because they've taken the future and they pulled it into the now. They've made that a reality today. Because that's, we all know that's impossible, isn't it? Somebody, somebody blind from birth. Has that ever been healed medically? I don't think, I don't know. I've never heard of such a thing, maybe. But to, for it to happen, bang, right there on the spot, absolutely, absolutely no strings attached, that is the kingdom of God. That's the future coming now. And that's what we've been called to do. That's the faith we've been called to. We've been called to put our faith and our trust in God. Pastor stands up here and, and he says, you know what, guys? I've got a vision. I've got a vision. He says, this place, this is Cinnabon Apostolic Church, is going to be a place of hope, healing, and restoration. He says, you know what, i got a vision that a sinner boy can be saved. i got a vision that we're going to have a house one day. That's gonna, that the people are going to come to and they're going to receive their healing and receive their restoration. And so what we learn and what we know now from Hebrews is not to sit and think, well, I hope, I, you know, I'm just so glad maybe one day it will come. Actually, there's actually something that's got to take place in our lives. Something that's got to take, we've actually got to start living and being as though the vision is taking place or coming to pass. We've got to set it so, we've got to set the promise in front of us. If God has made a promise to us, we've got to stand on it, we've got to live in it, and we've got to, we've got to be, it's like longing for a heavenly cult, c country. It's like longing for things ahead where you don't even see. And, 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 the, and the reason why I bring that up is because I don't want to get ahead of ourselves and say, okay, well, you know, now I'm, gonna, now I'm just going to believe that the future is coming now. And, you know, when you pray, you say, oh, Jesus, you're one who's coming to make war on the kingdom of, of darkness. Now be healed. Because that's still not the issue, is it? The issue is still and always will be, is Jesus the Lord of our lives? Is he high and lifted up? A kingdom is not a kingdom without a king. Wherever the rulership of God is, there his kingdom is. He will rule and he will reign. First he rules. First, he gets rulership of your life. First, absolutely all of us, every part of our hearts, remember every door or the whole house that pastor preached? The whole house? First, the whole house. Then the rain comes. Then the reign of God comes. Then the justice of God comes. I can't, I can't see from the Bible that coming out of order. And the reason why I said that these men got it was, be, that, uh, I said the reason was because they were Jewish. 
was because that they understood that. Now, Gentiles came in, but, and, and they started doing this too, but do you understand that their teachers were these men? Their teachers were men that had Jesus, the Lord of their lives. Now, today, we could have this, and we could be the people, and we're supposed to be the people that caused the Jews to be jealous. You know why? Because we're going to call Jesus our Messiah. He's going he's gonna to back us with the powers of heaven, and they're going to be jealous because we've given our lives to the Messiah, and they've been waiting to give their lives to the Messiah this whole time. So back then, that's the way it was. Today, it's supposed to be different. The Bible says that salvation was granted unto the Gentile to provoke the Jew to jealousy. And that's what we're supposed to do. It's going to happen. When we give Jesus all of our hearts, all of our lives. And that's why I saw this at list tonight. I said, this is perfect. I can't lay hands on anybody tonight, but that's not, I didn't want to. Because unless I can lay my hands on you and somehow magically you give Jesus more of your heart, I, it won't ever work that way. That's not the way it's going to happen. This is something that we have to do. Justin and I were having a conversation one time. We had to deal with a hard situation. I said to him, Justin, I said, I just like, I would just like, to force something, you know, to force a situation. He said, Josh, he said, do you remember when you got saved and when I got saved? He said, nobody came running after us. We had to come to Jesus ourselves. Nobody came to us. Not to say nobody didn't preach to us, but when you come to Jesus, you come and you offer yourself. He doesn't offer himself. He already did. We offer ourselves, our whole lives. Absolutely no, no gray areas because we can walk away from this message and think there's a gray area. There's no gray areas. Absolutely none. He's complete king. He's complete ruler. And so I saw the set list. I said, hallelujah. That's an amazing song. What does the uh, bridge go? Be high and lifted up. Be high and lifted up. Be high and lifted up. Jesus. <laughs> then we sing, be lifted high. Be lifted high. Be lifted high. Higher and higher, Lord. You see how this works? Because I think tonight, I, my plan is not to lay hands on anybody. Plus, I can't because we wouldn't have a drummer. I guess Stephanie could drum, but she's not here. Um, but I don't want to lay hands on you because this is, that's not what's supposed to happen. What's supposed to happen is we surrender more of our life to Jesus. We've been doing it this whole time, and we're actually really quite well. Like, as far as, as far as, you know, progress goes, we've been progressing, and it's happening. And I'm watching it happen in my life. I'm watching it happen in your lives. This really is happening. We are giving him more and more of our lives. And, oh, I should mention, it happens on a corporate level, too, because remember how I always thought that the kingdom was sort of in a thing? like in, a, in a, you know, parameters? Well, actually, what, what begins to happen is if Jesus is Lord of my life and I have the kingdom within me and Jesus is in your life and you got the kingdom within you and Jesus is in your life and you got the kingdom of God in you and we all come together, what happens? The kingdom of God is among us. It's among us. How is it that, um, I forget her name, Carol, had her ear, ears completely healed, just bang, right off the, nobody prayed for her, nothing, just bang. Because the kingdom Enough people in that moment, and this is why I love worship so much, because enough people in that moment glorified him with their whole hearts. And in those moments, I believe, and this is what I believe, and, and, and I, I mean, I, I see it in the scripture. I believe that people were giving their whole lives to Jesus, and the kingdom just started, the future just started to flood our midst. And sickness and disease just started leaving because that's, that seems to be the nature of the kingdom of God. It seems to be God's nature to heal. Praise the Lord. Anyways. So, um, Pastor Bob, I'll just give it right back to you, and the Holy Spirit leads you.